Hi, welcome back to Rust 101. This is video six. Uh, this time we're going to be talking about some types. Uh, specifically, we're going to look at structs and enums, which are the way of making your own types in Rust. Uh, things that are a bit like classes in other languages and also enums, which are just really cool. Okay, so let's start off by looking back over things we already know about types. Here are some types we looked at. Um, primitives like integers, floats, booleans, characters, and then compound types, as in types that you make by sticking together primitives or other things. Um, and we looked at tuples and arrays. Both of them are fixed length. Arrays, everything's all the same type, whereas a tuple is just a way of grouping together things of um, specific types, but um, kind of grouping them together. Um, and as the third bullet point says, um, most of the things except strings that we looked at are copy, which means um, if you say like uh, y equals x, and because you've, you've already got one of, um, with a, in a variable x, then after that y and x both have a copy of the thing. But most types you make in Rust are not copy, um, and so when you say y equals x, x will no longer have ownership and y will have ownership. That's all the stuff we talked about ownership before, uh, and then we looked at um, how to give out references last time. This time we're going to talk about how you make your own uh, your own types of stuff. Um, and hopefully um, borrowing will make more sense when we can see that uh, we often make types that um, are not copy and therefore um, you don't want to just pass a copy into a function, uh, maybe because it's too big or too complicated. Anyway, um, so we're going to look at some types. Um, and the way we make types in Rust, basically there's two, two important ways of doing that. Um, structs, which are basically a way of saying, um, I don't know, a flower has a stalk and some petals and some leaves, so it's like an and, uh, and enums, which is like an or, so you'd say um, a flower is either a tulip or a rose or a lavender. Um, so that's the kind of and type and or type. Most of us are familiar with classes in other languages, which are a bit like structs. They're a, they're a way of saying a thing is this and this, um, and probably less familiar with a kind of or type like enums, but they are awesome. They're one of my favorite features of Rust, and you wonder how you ever manage without them. Um, there is also this thing called a union in Rust, um, but it's basically relevant to your day-to-day -day life unless you're doing like advanced um, system type stuff or interfacing with other programming languages. Um, and my understanding, I don't know much about it, my understanding is that unions are a bit like unions in uh, C, as in um, difficult to cope with, and, and fortunately in Rust you don't have to worry about them. All right, so let's ha look at a struct. So first we're going to look at the type of struct that you don't use very often, which is a tuple struct. Um, so if you type, if you have the keyword struct, and then uh, then you give the thing a name. Here the name is control point, and then you you write something that looks just like a tuple. You know um, the type of a tuple. So this control point is made of um, two floating point numbers, 64-bit floating point numbers, and a boolean. Um, so this this works pretty much like a tuple, but it's got a name. Um, so you can make one like uh, you can see on line two there. Uh, again, similar to a tuple, but you put the name first, and then you can get the bits out of um, it by using the same syntax you use with a tuple. So cp.0 means get me the first thing in the tuple, so that would be the 10.5 here. Um, the difference between this and a standard tuple is that if you made a control point and you also made some other tuple with the same types in it, so if it was also f64, f64 bool, um, those are not the same thing, so you can't assign one to that to another or something like that. You can't pass one into a function when it's expecting the other type. So they're actually a really nice way of saying this thing is is a tuple, um, as in I don't want to give names to all the, the bits of it, um, but I don't want it to get mixed up with some other point just because it happens to have the same types. Um, so when you want a tuple but um, you want to be more clearer about it than that and give it a name, uh, this is an excellent thing to do, but that is not the normal way you use structs. The most common way of using structs looks like this, and this is where it looks more like, say, a class in another language. So here you say struct, uh, you give it a name, and then you have curly brackets, and then inside the curly brackets you say a name and a type, a name and a type, a name and a type. Um, and that means that you, you're you saying a control point consists of you know an x-coordinate, a y-coordinate, and whether or not it's enabled. Um, and like you'll never mix up x and y now, right? Because you know which is which. Um, 
and you can make one like this. So the, the top is how we declare it. So that's how we say this, this type of struct exists. And the bottom is how we create something of that type. So this would be in our, our main code. So you say the name and the curly brackets again. So very similar to when you're defining the type. And then you say x colon or like the name colon for the, and then put the value there. So instead of, so it looks really similar to where you're declaring it. And this can get confusing uh, initially, but, um, yeah, just, Remember that at one point you're saying that this thing exists, this type of thing can can exist. And then when you're actually using it, you need to say what, what values it takes. So it's a very similar syntax to make make it. So then now we've made this CP ver variable on line two. Now we can use CP on line seven. And yeah, so that's us making it. And then here we use it. So now instead of saying CP.0 like we did before to get the first thing out of it when it was just a tuple, now these things have a name, so we can get them out by name. So we can say cp.x to say, give me the x bit of this control point. So those are structs. They're a way of saying a control point consists of like an x coordinate, y coordinate, and a thing, or a, um, a flower consists of a stalk and some leaves and some petals. Um, and it's not either or, it's and. But the other type of thing we can do is an enum or enumeration, and that is an or type. So here's an example of a thing in computers, that's an OR, so we're saying we we want an IP address, but we know that there are two different, well, there are probably others that I don't know about, but there are at least two different ways of um, being an IP address. You know, you can't be both. You're not, if you're an IP address, you're not an IP4 and an IP6 address. You're either an IP4 address or you're an IP6 address. Um, so it's all the possibilities. Um, so we declare it up at the top there saying, you know, he, uh, say enum and then the name of it and then a curly bracket and then you list all the possibilities. And then to use it, you create one. And when you create one, obviously, it's only going to be one of the possible possibilities. You can't be some kind of combination of more than one. So um, on line two, we create an instance of IP address type um, by saying, please give me one of the specific uh, types of IP address there is an IP version 4 address. All right, so that's two alternatives, but we haven't seen the real power of it yet. The real power of it is because you can hold on to data inside those two different alternatives. So if you're an IP4 address, you're not just, we don't just want to know I am an IP4 address, we want to know what the address is, right? So an IP version 4 address consists of four um, bytes, or four U8 numbers. So you can see on line two, we're saying there is this alternative. We, uh, its name is IPv4, but the data that we're going to hold in it is this list of four U8s, or actually a, like a tuple. Um, again, it works a bit like a, a tuple. Um, and then on line three, we can say, but if it's an IP version six address, then it's not four U8s. It's, what is that, eight U16s, uh, because that's just ha the definition of an IP6 address. So, yeah, so then, so this is really helpful, right? Because you can say, you can say at some kind of high level, this thing is an IP address. And then when you want to dig in and say, okay, what type of IP address is it? And please, can I have the, the data associated with that type? Then the different types can have different data associated with them. So you can see um, in the second block on line two, how we create something with that data in. So like on line two of that second block, we're creating um, an IP4 address and we're passing in those four numbers to say this is a like the 127.0.0.1 address and then on the line below that we're making an ip version 6 address by passing in eight numbers which are in this case u16 although we can't see that here um all right so that's kind of the like meaning of an enum it could be either this or this and every with every variant that you have you can provide some data but it's worth knowing and keeping in mind um that actually any time you create any IP address in this example, the amount of space that's allocated in memory is going to be for the biggest variant of the variant. So if you have variants that are very different sizes from each other, you're going to essentially use space when you uh, waste space when you use up when you use one of the smaller variants. So the little diagram at the bottom there is illustrating to you um, if you make an IP4 address, you get those four U8s, but you also then have like a gap afterwards, which is the space that would have been used if this had been an IP6 uh, variant. So just bear that in mind for if you're making something, one of the, if one of your variants is huge, 
you probably don't want to hold it directly in the enum like this. Maybe you want to hold um, like hold something that points to it on the heap, and we'll talk about how you can do that later, or just structure things differently. So that's enums. So the, the question when you've got enums is, how are you going to get things back out of an enum if you've got that IP4 address? We've well, got an IP address, and it might be an IP4, it might be an IP6. How do you get stuff out? So there's two main ways of doing this. I would say this one, the if let one, is the more confusing way. Um, but, in, but in a way simpler, because it's just a way of getting like one variant out. So if we have a, an IP address and we want, we're only interested in this case in whether or not it's IP version four. And if it's IP version four, we want to do something with it. Well, what we do is on line two, we say if let, and then we say uh, like the pattern that we want to match. So in this case, it's an IP address colon colon IPv4. That means, um, we're looking, we're interested in if it is an IPv4 and not an IPv6. And then we have in, we have the brackets and we match like the pattern of the data that's inside the IPv4 address. And we're making new variables here. So we're making variables A and B. And then we're actually saying with the two underscores, we're saying, I'm not interested in the third and fourth digit. I'm only interested in the first two digits. So that's the pattern. And then we say equals. And then we put on the right hand side, like the value that we're, we're looking inside. So yeah, like I said, this feels to me like this is the more confusing, um, way of matching against patterns but actually it does it is matching patterns it's not just a kind of um this equals this left and right type thing is we provide on the left hand side we provide this kind of pattern that you're gonna um uh, match up or not match up and so if ip doesn't match that pattern in this case, because it's an IPv6 instead of an IPv4, then you just go into the else block, or in this case, there is no else block, so you just do absolutely nothing. If it does match the pattern, then um, we'll go into the if block. And the reason why I'm saying it's just it's a pattern as opposed to just like a fixed thing like IPv4 is because we could have said, um, instead of A, we could have said something like 127 here, and then it, this pattern would only match if that the first number in there was actually exactly 127 so you, there's quite sophisticated matching you can do here which we'll get into um but for now basically this is a, a convenient way of saying um if it's an ip4 i want to do something otherwise not and yeah it's really important to understand the reason why the word let is there i guess is because um we're actually making new variables here a and b and that means that on line three we can use a and b um, if we end up in the if because we did match the pattern a and B are going to be the first two numbers in that IP address. And as it says, the underscores can be used to, to match against any value, but um, not get, then that value won't actually be available to you. So underscore is a way of saying ignore this, and then saying A or B like that is a way of saying please make me a new variable um, with that value in. So that's the slightly more confusing form, I think. And so now let's look at the slightly less confusing form, I think. Um, uh, which is match. So um, in, in the match statement, you say match and then the thing that you're matching, which is why I guess I find it less confusing, right? Because you, you, up front you're saying, I want to match this thing. And then further down you're saying, how are you going to match it? So, and then again, once you're inside the match, the curly brackets of the match, you then got um, patterns that you want to match against. So in this case, we're 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 only matching two very specific IP addresses, and otherwise um, we're just saying you are not home. So the first branch, we're saying if it's an IP version 4 address, but not just if it's an IP version 4 address, if it's actually got these exact numbers in it, 127,0,0,1, that's when we print you are home. Um, if it was an IP version 4 address, but it had some other numbers in it, this pattern wouldn't match. If we put letters in there instead of those numbers, like we did in the previous example, that would mean match any number in this situation and then give me that number as as the, uh, the variable with that name, the name of the letter that you supplied. So that's what we did on the last slide. So let's just jump back there quickly. So here we provided letters to say match anything in this position. And we also provided underscores, which means match anything, but um, I don't want to use it. Whereas here, whoops, whereas here, we provided a specific number, and that means you'll only end up in this block if this exact set of numbers 
is in the IP, is in IP. So it's not just if it's an IP version 4, but if it has these exact numbers in it. And then the syntax is, as you can see, um, match against this pattern, and then we put this arrow, uh, which is just an equal sign and a greater than sign, and then in curly brackets, or you don't actually always have to have curly brackets. If you're, if you're only putting one expression there, you don't need the curly brackets. Um, and then whatever you want to do goes inside here. And again, if you'd put A here, you would be able to use A inside here. And then similarly, we match against an IP6 address. And again, we, we're, we're saying only if it's this exact set of numbers, get into this block on line 7 and print you're in your new home. Otherwise, we match against just a pattern, which is just an underscore. So that says, I don't care what type of thing it is. It can be anything at all. Now, obviously, it's only going to be an IP address because that's what we said on line one. But in, in principle, that underscore means anything else um, will match and go into here. And it's important to know that um, we the way Rust processes this is from top to bottom. So we'll look and we'll say, does it match this first one? And if it does, we'll do something and then finish. And if it doesn't, we'll try the next one. And then we'll say, does it match this one? And if it does, we'll, we'll do it and then finish. And if not, we'll go on to the next one. So there's no point putting anything after this underscore arm because this will match everything, right? So it'll be, if it's, like, if it's this specific address, go here. If it's this specific address, go here. Otherwise, um, do this. So they, what, that is what we call exhaustive, which means um, every possibility is covered um, because of that underscore at the end. And sometimes you can do an exhaustive thing without uh, needing the underscore, but uh, Rust will tell you whether you've covered everything. Um, what else to say about that? Yeah, the, 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 the sections of this match statement are called arms. Don't know why. Um, yeah, all right. So um, the other thing that we can do with match is similar to how we saw you could do with if in previous video, match can also be an expression. So um, you can say match against an IP address, and then whatever you give back at the end, it then is then going to get put into get returned essentially. In this case, put into this first byte variable. So this is another match statement. Where again, we're matching on an IP address, but this time we're not giving specific numbers. We're giving letters, like I was saying. And in this case, we're saying if it's an IP address, IP IP four address. And actually, in this case, it could be any IP4 address, right? Because we're ignoring the last three numbers, and the first number could be anything. And whatever anything it is, put that into A. And then we're saying the arrow to say, then what you do if it is an IP4 address is, and then you return A. So what we're saying is, any IP4 address, give me the first byte in that IP address, and then we give that back. And then we're saying here, any IP6 address, again, give me back A, the f as in the first um, U16 in that IP version 6 address, but this time in order to make a byte, we have to divide it by 256 and turn it into a U8, right? But anyway, the point is, um, the first byte of this IP6 address is going to get returned, so this is going to be a U8, right? It's going to be, because both, both arms of the match return the same type of thing, which, by the way, you always need all the arms of the match to return the same type of thing. And then we can print out first byte, because either way, um, the, uh, the only possibilities for IP, the IP here is that it's either an IP4 or an IP6. And because these match any IP4 and any IP6, we know that this is a fully exhaustive match. So there's no way of getting to the end of this line without putting something valid into first byte. So this kind of works. Um, yeah, and as it says in this bottom bullet point, we don't need an underscore arm. We don't need a match, a catch-all arm, because we've already handled all the possible IP addresses already. So... Yeah, so that the, the, all of that is to say, if you've got an enum, which is an either or, you need a way of like extracting the stuff out again, or like basically doing something based on whether it's this or this. And this is the way we do it. We either use an if let, if we want to just get out one possibility, um, or we use a match to match all kinds of possibilities. And um, what we've introduced you to, to here is not just um that you can choose which of the possibilities it is but also you can do this very sophisticated pattern matching of saying not just if it's an ip version 4 address but if it's an ip version 4 address that it starts with 127 or something like that okay so that was structs and enums and we can actually make structs and uh, enums even more powerful um 
by adding generics, which you might have seen in other languages. So here's an example of a situation where we might want generics and we haven't used them yet. So imagine we've got two structs, one which is a point which is made out of floating point numbers, and one which is a point which is made out of integers. Um, and you could imagine, um, especially if we start putting methods on these structs, which you can do, um, this is going to get repetitive, um, and you're going to end up with a lot of code that does the same thing, um, but just to different types of thing. So what you can do, instead of making one for every type, you can just say, I want a point, and I want to be able to talk about some type, t. Um, and so a point is just a, a t at comma a t. So this is a, notice by the way, these are tuple structs, right? So they know like x and y names of this. It's just a, a, a point is um, two numbers, one after the other. So we're making, you can use generics with, with both tuple structs and normal structs. Um, and what you do to, to define the type of a generic thing is you say its name, and then in diagonal brackets you say what types, what kind of variable, like type variables you want here, right? So these are like, uh, this is saying, when I talk about T, I want you to know that it could be any type. And then I just say, well, the, the things, instead of saying F64, F64 here, I just say T, comma T. So now I'm saying, essentially, this line one is saying um, a point is a thing which is two of some type. Now, in practice, we probably want to be a bit more specific than that and say it's got to be like a number in some way. Um, but for now, this will this will get us where we need to go. Um, and then, so that's on line one, you can see how we define a point like that. And this will be a point that, that kind of replaces the two in that top block, the point float and the point int, because we can make any kind of point now. Um, and then on line four is how you would make one of these. So you declare it. If you wanted to, to declare the type, you would say, uh, like this is like the colon blur is like the optional thing saying what type it is. And here we're being explicit and saying the type of it is point F64. So this is kind of, it kind of replaces point float, right? You can say point and then in diagonal brackets, you can say what T is in this case. Um, and then you say equals point 10.0, 10.0. .0, um, and it will like check that obviously and say, if you passed in an integer here, it would say, well, this is supposed to be an F64 because you, you've provided, that's what you've said it is here. Um, and similarly to make an oint, and one based on an I64, you just declare it like this and then say point 10, 10. All right. So there's a lot more to generics. Uh, there's a lot of ways you can say this is not just any type T, but this is like got to be a number or got to be all kinds of stuff. So that we will come back to that and it will get really hairy. Um, but for now, that's enough for us to know um, you can make structs which are actually kind of templates for structs um, with all kinds of different types. And underneath the, the compiler will kind of generate code that looks a little bit like the top block there. All right, so let's look at an example of an enum. And this is the last thing we're going to do today, because um, I think we've covered a lot, right? We've covered structs and enums and how to unpack stuff out of enums. And then we talked about generics, which is uh, uh, could be really confusing. So now we're going to just give you one example that hopefully draws some of this enum stuff together, right? So um, uh, th there is a an enum type in the standard library of Rust called option. And this is, uh, again, one of my favorite things in Rust, um, because in Rust you don't have the possibility that just any old variable might be null, like you have in other languages. Instead, if, if something might be present or not present, you have to be really, really explicit about it. Instead of saying, I want to return a number, you have to say, I want to return an option of number. And then you can see what option is, is it's generic over any type T. And it's either going to be something, so some and then a T, or it's going to be none, which means nothing. So what well, the meaning of this is, I'm returning something and it's either going to be there or it's, or it's not going to be there. And if it's there, I want to actually give you it. So I'm not just returning an either or to say there's, there was either something or nothing. I'm returning either there's nothing or there's something and here is the something. So here's our Hello, later Andy here. Uh, that got really abstract, didn't it? So um, I thought I'd break in here and try and do uh, an example that might make it a bit clearer. So let's make ourselves a new project. Um, let's call it up to four, which will become clear in a second. Um, so let's have a look inside here. All we're going to do is just edit the main RS. And what I thought we would do is make a new struct 
called up to four, which is going to basically contain um, up to four numbers in it. So the way we're going to use this struct is we're going to make one. Um, let's call it ut ut4. So it's going to be we're going to make a new one, um, and then we're going to be able to do things to it like add things. So let's add a number. Let's add the number three, uh, and then add the number uh, two, um, and then we're going to be able to remove things from it. And we want to. So once when we've added the three and the two, it should have like three and two in it. You know, it should look like this. And then I want to be able to take things out of it. So I'll do remove, and I want to be able to take the top thing out. So I want to say, give me, give me the top thing or the latest thing. The latest thing I added was a two, so X should be two. So I have to be able to do um, something like this. Assert that X is equal to two. This assert e just means um, if this equals this, then we're okay. And if not, it should crash. Okay, so th that's the kind of thing that we're trying to build. You could think of it as like a stack, uh, in which case add would be called push and remove would be called pop. Um, so let's write these methods for our struct like this. So we haven't done this yet, how to write methods, but this is how you write methods. Um, and we're going to take in a, a number to add. So we'll, we'll just call that uh, num. And let's make it an i32, shall we? And this, for now, this function is not going to return anything. Um, and we're going to make a remove function, which just removes the top thing. And, and that's going to return an i32, right? So for now, let's just make it re return like the number one so that this compiles. OK, so now what is our compiler complaining about? Um, Oh yeah, are these I haven't made these methods. All right, I've done it wrong. So in order to make a method, you have to take a reference to self like this. Um, and yeah, we're not using the number variable. That's okay. So now we can run this code um, like this. We get some warnings, uh, and it currently fails because on that last line we get back a one because remove always returns one, and we want it to return a two. So let's continue implementing this until it actually works, right? So let's put some kind of, um, so let's just say like we can store four numbers in here because that's why I called it up to four so that I could do it in a simple way. So we're going to say this is um, an array of i32 that is four long, like so. And why don't we just make a new method for it as well to construct one. This is how you make a method to construct one of your things. Um, an array is going to be, uh, let's just say it's an array of the zeros, like so. Now, in order to, for this to work, we're also going to need to keep track of like how many numbers we've added so far, because at the beginning, um, there are none in there, right? So let's just say that we've got a, a you said to say how many things are in, how many things have we actually stored in here? Um, so how many should start off at zero? Oops, that shouldn't be a semicolon, it should be a comma. Okay, so the way we're implementing this kind of list of up to four things is we have an array that's always got four things in it, but then we keep track of how many are actually have been added and how many are just placeholder values. Now we obviously wouldn't implement it this way at all. Um, but this is me trying to demonstrate why you, the option enum might be useful. All right, so this up to four now needs to call new to construct it because we need to set up the array and the how many. So we call it, we just wrote the new function to do that work for us. So now we've got this thing called up to four, which can take up to four things. We can add things to it. We can remove things from it. But we haven't written those functions yet. So let's write those functions. So the add function is going to be something along the lines of um, what's well going to be first of all, if how many is greater than uh, four, then we're just going to return because we can't add any more, right? It should be self, obviously. 
We can't add more than four. So for now, we'll just not do anything. Otherwise, we're going to say... So this should be greater than three, right? Um, how, uh, yeah, we're going to put the number in at the right place, and then we're going to make how many one bigger. Right, our list got one longer. It should be self. Um, our list got one bigger, and we just insert something into our array that's, that's storing there. Um, let's make... Okay, it should be U-size. Let's make this be a U-size to make our life easier. Uh, yep, and this needs to be mutable for us to modify it, which means we need to make it mutable here. So this is all set up, right? So we're, 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 all, we're getting to how we're going to use option, and it's going to be what, how do we implement remove. So now we've written the add function. Uh, now let's write the remove function. So our remove function is going to be, um, we're going to get hold of the value that we're going to return. We're going to reduce how many by one, right? Make the array one smaller. And then we're going to return um, whatever was in how many before we increased it, before we decreased it. Obviously, I'm missing self here. I'm struggling with self today. Difficult sense of self. All right, so and again, this needs to be mutable um, for this to work. So now we've got a remove function which returns. So now maybe will our test pass? Uh, our test doesn't pass. We get back a zero. We should be getting back a two. So we've obviously implemented this wrong. Um, why? What have we done wrong? Um, we, we, I guess we need to print some stuff out so we can figure this out, right? Um, let, why don't we write, why don't we make this debuggable um, by saying, if this is just going to be a good example of how Andy can't write code, it's not really going to... I might help your morale a bit, I guess. So let's just... Now we can do... There's actually a really nice thing in, in Rust called debug. Um, and if we call that, it just prints out ourself at each point. Um, yeah, let's do it just before the last line. Run ourselves, and it should print out our state. Okay, so after the first add... Well, this is on line 21, so line 21 is after an add. So after the first add, we've just got a 3 and how many is 1, so that looks right. Then we've got a 3 and a 2 and how many is 2. So it looks like add is working. And then uh, when we remove, um, how many is 1? Yeah, I've got, I've got an off by 1 error. So after we've removed, we've reduced how many down to 1, so we should be returning um, the, the one with index 1. So this should be... Okay, so now I think our tests will pass, uh, which is fine, right? Um, except our code isn't actually working yet, because if we keep removing stuff, what happens when we re remove too many? Just, uh, so we'll, we'll get out the, the, the another value. It should come out as three, and that should be fine. But then what happens when we ask for another value out of here? What should Z be when we've removed something that wasn't even there? Because we only put two things in. We've taken them out again. What should Z be? Mm, I don't know. Let's say zero, something like that. What actually happens um, is we crash. We crash on line 25. We panic, attempting to subtract with overflow on line 25. So in, in release mode, I don't think we'd crash, but in debug mode, we're trying to make how many less than zero. So this uh, this code has a problem. And one way of expressing that problem is, actually, the function signature of remove is wrong. Um, remove needs to check whether we've got more than zero elements inside. So we need to do something along the lines of if self.howmany 
is zero, what do we do? Well, we could just return zero, right? Uh, and then actually our tests will pass. Let's try that. Yep, I'll just get rid of all our debugging for now. Oops. Um, yeah, and it, every, that basically nothing went wrong, so it, it all passed. Let's just print out all tests passed at the end, shall we? All tests, whoops. All tests pass. Um, and that makes us feel good, right? Because it says all tests pass at the bottom. Um, all right. So that uh, that would be fine, but that, this is not very good, right? Like, there's, there's not a zero at the bottom of this, this stack of things. There's nothing there. You can't, you shouldn't have called remove. Or you should at least be prepared in some way to deal with the fact that um, uh, remove isn't an appropriate thing to do at this point. So the way to do it is to use option, which is the thing we were just talking about. Instead of returning an i32, we return an option of i32. Uh, and then we've got, the, the, what this is expressing is that there might we might give you something back, or we might not be able to because there aren't any things to give back. So now we can say, um, if, uh, if there are no things left in our list, then return none. By the way, we could have said option i32. Normally when you're using enums, whoops, you talk about it like this. You say option i32, colon, colon, none. Um, in our, in our case, because option is so popular, um, it's already available. We're allowed to just say none. Normally you would say that whole thing. But now we've got a problem because we're not returning the right stuff at the end here. And um, because now we're, retur we're returning an i32 and we should be returning an option of i32. So the right thing to do here is to say we're returning some thing. Now, because we've checked, we've already checked that this is uh, not empty. If it was empty, we return none. That's fine. Um, otherwise, uh, we return some. So I, I probably want to just refactor this to be an if else. Now I don't need this return here. I can just say this is an if expression, which either returns none or returns some. OK, so um, that's fine. Uh, this this function looks right, and this is how you, you use option in that way to return something. But now the code that uses it is obviously wrong. Um, and what we need to do is a match statement. Because, at, well, let's, well, the point is x now is not an i32. If I said, if I say i32 here, it says, no, that's not an i32. It's an option of i32. Right? So I have to say option i32. I could, I could leave it out, but I'm just going to put it in to be explicit. X is an option of i32. That means I can't compare it against the number two here, which is an i32. But what I do can do is I can say it's the same as sum two. And here I can say sum three. And here I can say none. Oops, like so. Uh, but in a minute, I'll show you a match statement instead. But let's just do that. Now our tests pass. Okay, good. So it's returning the stuff we think, and basically remove always returns either yes, I was able to remove something and it was a two, or no, I wasn't able to remove anything. But let's show you how to deal with that in a match statement. Let's get rid of our assertions now. And let's add a match statement. So we're going to say match x. So because x is an enum, yeah, this is quite a suitable thing to say match on. And my editor is offering to fill in the arms, so the arms that were allowed for x, the two things that could happen with an option, is either something or nothing. Um, and, and it's put in an underscore here to say anything and I don't care what it is, but I actually want to know what it is. So let's just put in the name of a variable here, n, and then let's print out. Uh, n is blah, like so. And then if nothing happened, let's print something else out. Something along the lines of uh, 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 x was none. OK, now we run our code. What's it going to do? Well, it's going to say n is 2. So hopefully that's just a little bit of a practical explanation of how this is how you would return an option and why you would return an option, because there might not be anything to return. Um, and you would you would return either none or some, and the return type is option of i32, and then this is how you would use an option. You get you get it given back by remove, and then you need to do a match on it to figure out um, whether it's a sum or a none.
or any other option type, like we'll see more later. Sorry, any other enum type, and we'll see more later. Okay, back to uh, rambling Andy um, talking about abstract concepts. So here's our example on line seven. If we want to make um, make an instance of option, which is is something, and the specific thing it is is the number forty two, then that's what we do on line seven. We just say sum brackets forty two, um, and if we want to make a none value. Um, we need to declare like what what type it is because it wouldn't be at all clear to the compiler what it's an option of if the value you're putting in it is none. So we need that colon part in line eight. So we can say this could be a string, but actually it's a none. Uh, that's kind of what line eight means. So we, the the variable name is no string, and then after the colon we say option uh, bracket string diagonal bracket string, and then the value that it's got inside it is none. So we're saying. Uh, yep, in this case, it could be a string, but there's actually nothing in there. Um, something to notice that might be a bit confusing about this is that before when we were doing IP addresses, every time we talked about one of the the um, options, one of the types, um, we we had to write IP4 address colon colon, and then this the 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 name of the 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 variant of the option um, because. Oh, the variant of enum. Because option is built into the standard library, you don't have to say option colon colon sum here. You can just say sum. So that, um, although that's very convenient when you get used to it, it's a little bit confusing because um, enums that come from the standard library, like option and result, which we'll look at next time, you don't have to do that um, option colon colon part as part of um, specifying the types, which means they look a little bit different from the ones you create yourself. Um, and you can actually, if you want to, when you import the ones you created yourself, you can also bring them in so that you don't have to say that name. But that's quite rare. Normally, people do put the um, the whole the enum name colon colon the value um, because it makes code quite a lot less confusing. But for some and none, and also which are the option type, and also for the variants of the result type that we'll talk about next time, that would just be way too much typing. So, um, I guess what I'm saying is, rest assured, some and none are exactly the same as the ver the other variants. Um, of of things like IP address, um, it's just that it's a bit quicker to type them. So yeah, that's an example, and I guess uh, all of this will become clearer when um, you see it in use, right? So at the moment, I've just said to you like there is this thing called option which could either be something or nothing, um, but it's probably a little bit difficult to imagine when you would want to use that and how you you would use it. Um, so with this sum um, with this option type, um, you can use if let. And you can use match, just like with IP address. So that would be one way you would use it. But there are also um, methods on these enums, which we'll see, which make them really convenient to work with. So essentially, you never have that uncertainty of, oh, is this going to be null? Do I need to check it's null? I'm not sure if I already checked whether it was null in the previous method. Uh, in Rust, it's all completely explicit. You know for definite um, if it could be nothing, well, then it's going to be wrapped up inside an option. If it's not wrapped up inside an option, it definitely can't be nothing. It's definitely going to be a real a real number or a string or whatever it is inside there. Um, so once you get used to that, you're going to really like it. And uh, with error handling, it's even better, I think. Um, you, you, uh, you can always say, you always know, uh, if this thing might fail, you're going to return either a thing saying it was okay, or a thing saying it was an error. So we'll get to that next time. Uh, hope you enjoyed. Any questions, comments, etc., um, stick them in the comments, and see you next time.